Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. I'm very happy to be here with you. And thanks, Nick, very much for this invitation. I've been listening to some of the workshops yesterday and today and, and was fascinated by how practical you are. I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> we advise policies to our ministers of 192 ministers who are part of FAO. And what we do reflects really what the uh, line ministries want in agriculture, and this is where the struggles come from. My position is the advisor, the senior advisor of the um, head of the environment department of FAO. So we're a little bit like a ministry of environment trying to shake the ministry of agriculture, and it's not always successful. Mm -hmm. This is the way we work. And in a way, it's, um, it's challenging because it keeps us on our toes. And when we come up with solutions, we are really challenged to come with the right solutions. Um, and I'm going to present to you what sustainable intensification, organic agriculture, and food security mean for FAO, what's happening. And when I say FAO, it's really the membership of FAO. It's not officers like me working, like you know, staff members. First of all, I'd like to start with definitions. Yes, we did define sustainable intensification. Of course, there are different interpretations of sustainable intensification. It could be also uh, organic agriculture, so sustainably intensifying production in, in Africa, for example, in low income, in low uh, um, fertility areas. Um, Agroforestry is sometimes defined, but when we define sustainable intensification and got agreement from the membership on what sustainable intensification, this is the um, the um, definition you have. It says, the optimization of crop production per unit area through the management of biodiversity and ecosystem services. So it does have this ambition to look at biodiversity and ecosystem services. And when we looked at the practices that are part of sustainable intensification in the world, and this is captured in one of our publications called Save and Grow, and that ministers love, it's uh, mainly conservation tillage, integrate pest management, like biological control of pests, and precision agriculture. So this is what is intended by sustainable intensification in FAO. <coughs> and it reflects very much what USDA and other governments are meaning when they say sustainable intensification. And when you look at the implication of that, it's really about the production approach. It's a productivist approach. And it's mainly about crops. And in fact, in FAO, we say sustainable crop production intensification. Animals, now we're starting, but very often this, the systems are separated. Organic agriculture, we have different definition. We have a long definition in codex, but it's very much um, similar to the IFOAM one. I've taken the IFOAM one here. Uh, it's, it's, it's really something which is very familiar to you. It's a systems approach and we're having plant and animals together in the system. <coughs> so these are, let's say, uh, in terms of characteristic, you know, how it comes in terms of definition. <coughs> then when we talk about food security, because everybody wants to feed the world, you know, what is food security? <coughs> food security in is when all people at all times have physical, social, and economic access. Economic access is very important. Having enough food is not sufficient to have economic access, and that's why today we have about 925 million people who go hungry. Um, sufficient is the availability. Safe and nutritious food, which meets which meet the dietary needs and food preferences. For and this the, here you have the cultural element, the preferences, for an active and healthy life. And this is the definition that was done by the governments in 96 when we had the World Food Summit. So when you really look at this definition, and this is very often very misinterpreted, it's not only about food availability, but also about access to food, utilization of food, and stability of food systems. And I will come back to that. <coughs> now when we look at these paradigms of sustainable intensification and organic agriculture, Sustainable intensification in most of the official texts of the governments and line ministries is about advancing the productivity frontier. It's about closing the yield gap. It's primarily a technological approach that is looking at innovations. Innovations very often are limited maybe to uh, genetic engineering, but it's about innovation in general. <coughs> the approach is very much unilateral. We have a problem, let's focus on it. We have climate problems, we're going to go to climate smart systems. We have water problems, which is going to be our problem of the future. It's water smart cereals, whatever. And it's mainly uh, 
in sustainable intensification, the intent is for the food security, the nutrition part, is to have more calories produced by area. And it's um, quite difficult to have statistics, but when I looked at the data that we have worldwide, USDA has a very good website where it has been putting the nutrient index of the major crops in the US since 1940s or something. And you can see that almost all crops have lost about one third of their nutrient. And this is quite worrying. We don't have enough data to, to say that on a global basis, but definitely the modern systems maybe are producing more, but with less nutrients. The other problem when we talk about food security is that we do have micronutrient deficiencies for about two billion people. So we do have something wrong with the food that we are eating and its quality. When we turn to organic agriculture, the aim is to enhance the natural resource process to have both goods and environmental services. The research that has happened today, by default, uh, has been people driven, trial and error, because there was no support <coughs> from outside. So in a way, it has grown from within. The approach is holistic and looks at the whole food chain. I mean, it's not only about production, but keeping the claim and processing and, and retailing. In terms of nutrient, even if it's not a direct um, objective of organic agriculture, again, by default, <coughs> there is mounting evidence, maybe not scientific evidence as yet, but definitely mounting evidence that there are more nutrients uh, in organic food because there is more diversity, because crops may be more adapted to uh, pests and diseases, so you have to use different, uh, uh, different varieties and breed, hence you have more nutrients which are on your plate. Now for Rio Plus 20, I was given the uh, task to lead the FAO work to do the green economy work for Rio, and I have put um, a USB card down for distribution and you can have more information about this and more details. And what we did as part of this work was to compare about, categorize 21 different farming systems, organic, sustainable intensification, agroforestry, uh, high intensive input agriculture and so forth. And we have compared all the publications and knowledge which exists on those systems, which is available in the literature, and we try to evaluate them according to efficiency, resilience, connectedness, uh, coherence, and diversity. And here I'm going to give you the comparison, or at least the outcome of only two of these systems, sustainable intensification and organic agriculture. <coughs> in, the case of, in the case of efficiency of sustainable intensification systems, which means the productivity under normal conditions, we can see that indeed we do have a substantial increase in yields and reduced input of water, energy, and labor. So in a way, it's more efficient. Yes, it's producing more. Resilience means the productivity of a system under disturbed conditions. And this is something we have to live with now with climate change. And we have seen that because of the, um, um, the, the, the different uh, uh, varieties that are used. There is an improved resilience to climate extre extremes in sustainable intensification. However, there is more vulnerability of those systems to macroeconomic shocks. And we have seen that, for example, in 2008, when the fertili fertilizer prices have gone up. So there is a dependence on input of suppliers when there are increases in prices. In terms of connectedness, and here we look at connectedness in terms of transboundary impacts, in the environment and also of participation of people. We do have an improved water system uh, in terms of groundwater recharge, in terms of soil carbon, uh, organic carbon. Coherence, the ecological balance and the economic integration are integrated within that indicator. And we could see that in sustainable intensification, we do have a positive impact on the soil habitats. And there is a lot of benefit where there's not enough labor because it uses less labor. In terms of biodiversity, sustainable intensification does safeguard soil biodiversity, but it may use, in many cases, GMOs, which do cause <coughs> risk of cross-pollinations, and there's also an, an increased use of glyphosate and weed resistance. The sustainability of organic agriculture, when we look at it, it is producing less if it's compared to high external system agriculture. Um, 
high external input agriculture, but it is much more uh, uh, efficient in terms of nutrient yield ratio and long-term soil productivity. It's economically more profitable, and this comes from a study we did in 2009 based on existing literature, even without price premium. So here, even if the yields were lower, the profitability is usually higher. In terms of resilience, the organic systems are more resilient to climate variability and also market price fluctuations. And we've seen that in, terms, in times of crisis, the only uh, food system that keeps growing is the organic sector, even if it's at slower rate. Connectedness, the habitat enhancement, which are usually practiced on organic farm, do reduce the landscape fragmentation. There is no pesticide drift because they're not used, of course, and it's more vibrant in terms of community-based uh, development. In terms of coherence, the fact that organic systems seek to have closed or semi-closed nutrient and energy cycle does optimize within the limits of the viability of the farming, of course, the agroecosystem balance, except in cases where a lot of inputs are used from outside, which is, which is happening in some regions of the world, as you all know. In general, it gives more, <coughs> more on-farm jobs and enhances socio-economic integration. Diversity, we have a lot of feeble studies on biological diversity, which is enhanced for flora and faunal diversity. There's a value-added income and also a blend between scientific knowledge and traditional knowledge. So we look at system sustainability, but then it's important also to put them in perspective. What are they giving in, in terms of delivery today? Sustainable intensification was, was very difficult to, to know uh, how far it's practiced because it's not defined, but we could at least take the definition of where it was boiled down to no till agriculture. And in the case of conservation tillage, we had in 2010, 125 million hectares. In organic, we had 37. It's the same year of comparison. In terms of world food supply, while we all know that it's about 2% of the retail in organic agriculture in the case of sustainable intensification, because there is no definition, there is no way to define it. For labor, sustainable intensification used much less labor, which is good where there is no labor available, but usually agriculture is a major provider of employment and in areas where there is need for work, uh, it does usually require about 30% more labor. It's a word average, of course, with differences. In terms of ecosystem services, sustainable intensification is good in terms of provisioning and regulating services, but only for soil, while for organic, it's for all media, soil, water, biodiversity, and climate. So uh, we could see that sustainable intensification is more conducive in areas which are well endowed and on large holdings, well, ecological intensification or organic agriculture, which could be also extensification, by the way, it's not always intensification in the case of organic, uh, performs much better in poorly endowed areas. The other component that I'm not going to dwell on today, but which is important to keep in mind, is that when policymakers talk about sustainable intensification and food security, it's because the system as has also in its paradigm some trade orientation. I mean, we're going to trade food where it's missing. Where in organic agriculture, it's much more a consumer choice and a tendency, even if it's not a um, defined uh, intent, is to relocalize the food systems. And there are many cases where <coughs> we have had projects in developing countries, developing countries and remote areas where organic agriculture intended as harnessing natural resource processes, not necessarily going for the market or certifying was, was really important in feeding the local population. And it's important to have extension system that can improve those systems where <coughs> hunger resides and not away. And we have a very nice case in the Tigray region in Ethiopia, where in the early 80s about, I mean, that was where the hungry were. And you come back now and people are, are food secure 100% just by um, mulching and agroforestry and all the organic practices that have been introduced in the last 10 years or so. So why sustainable intensification? I mean, it came really from a 
we, we all know that we have a situation where we have natural resource scarcity. I mean, we have hit our limits and we have uh, climate change and we, have, we are expecting to have more than 9 billion people in 2050. So if today we have so many people who don't have enough food to eat, what, what is it going to be in 2050? The FAO perspective studies for 2030-2050 did say that we need to increase production. <coughs> Originally we said 70%, now it's revised to 65%, but it's still the famous 70% that you hear all the time about increasing production mm -hmm. between 2000 and 2050. So the first um, mm, uh, conclusion that have that have come to many policymakers is, oh, so we have to produce more food with less resources. So sustainable intensification is the answer. This is how it came, and you can see it in the background of most of the policy documents that you see. In reality, if you look at the FAO projection and you try to interpret the language quite correctly without misinterpretation, as it's happening today, we say that it's not that we need 75 or 65 percent of more food produced, but we're expecting to have that much. And it's a very important difference. And how this calculation was made was also made on the basis of the GDP prospects in 2050. And it was quite optimistic prospects. And we could see that this does not account for crises, for the economic crisis for the moment. And also, most importantly, and this analysis, you have it in the USB stick that I have been distributing outside, is that this image is not accounting of regional imbalances. It's about global. I mean, in one area, there would be a lot of food. In other one, there would be, like in North Africa, for example, there is no water. There will be no possibility to grow enough food. So we assume that trade is going to compensate. So on average level, it's going to feed everybody. But this is not how it happens in reality. And it is assuming that the food trade will intensify and the food import dependency is already worrying in many countries. Also, the food wastage is not calculated. Food wastage in terms of post-harvest losses in developing countries is about 30% of the food which is produced and never goes in the plates. In developed countries at the retail and consumer level, it's another 30%. So we can confidently say that at least 30% of what is produced is never consumed, is lost. Uh, so there are different problems, of course, in all these uh, food equations that we have. And we cannot assume that just by one production system we're going to fix all this. We have to really act at different points of the chain. However, if we take the projections, the projections that we have made and that we do every some years in the agricultural projections of FAO, we take two commodities into consideration, livestock and meat products and crops, because most 40% of the cereals go to animals worldwide. So uh, in terms of the 2050 population, looking at technology improvements, at uh, the demand of developing countries that now are becoming middle uh, income country and that are going to request more meat and so forth, we will need 85% more meat to meet that demand and 66% more crops. And this is where the famous 70% comes from. So five, five minutes. Ooh. Okay. <laughs> the most important thing is what I'm going to say now is uh, last year, we commissioned Feeble to do a major modeling of all the data we have to look at what would happen if the world production became organic. And it's a shock scenario, I call it. What would happen if the fossil fuel prices were so high that we have to switch to a different system? Like what happened in Cuba, for example. It's hypothetical. We took all the FAO stat figures, we put them in a model, we looked at food supply, food demand, and food balance sheets, and we looked at impact on natural resources, on income, on labor, on different aspects, <coughs> and we modeled scenarios. I'm not going to go through that because I don't have too much time. We have six scenarios. The baseline is what's happening today, and we're looking at the use of land in terms of arable crops, permanent crops, and grasslands. We're looking at livestock numbers. We worked different herd structures because we had to categorized between low input system, intermediate input systems, and high input systems. 
feeding rations, and we've done a lot of work on the concentrate, no concentrate. Commodity trade, prices, utilization of commodities. We have done food, feed, seed, and waste, but we still want to add biofuels. Population numbers and nutritional requirements. I mean, how many calories by person, and so forth. The baseline scenario is the existing one that you all hear about of 2050, which are the official FAO projections uh, on the population numbers and what the intensification of agriculture would bring in 2050. Then we had one scenario about organic, uh, about no, about livestock production with 50% concentrate feed as compared to today, or 100% um, uh, re reduction. So, which means no no feed, and we used the uh, uh, no fee uh, food no feed project uh, result for that. And then we have one scenario of full conversion to organic agriculture, and this one includes again to. <coughs> Define that it's it's important. We have to, we we looked at uh, the standards in terms of management of grassland, in terms of production of concentrate from from the cropland and other lands, and we have a sixth scenario that does combine four and five, which is organic with 100% no concentrate. And this is the result. Now to discuss this would need a whole morning. <laughs> But I'm going to highlight just a few things for you. Uh, scenario two is the baseline for 2050, and scenario five is the organic scenario. And, and if you look at the, M and at the figures, you can see that if we converted the whole livestock production worldwide to organic, we can feed the world. And this is very important. You have the food energy for human consumption, 116% versus the 106 huh, that we have. Um, you look at the environmental indicators in terms of nutrient use, phosphorus use, global warming potential, and so forth, they're all positive. Under the only negative figure is the one on land degradation, because we will need more land, of course. We have, we, so we're still working on the deforestation figures, but we will need much more land. And this is not, of course, uh, good enough. The best scenario would be combining four and six, five and six, which is organic with no concentrate feed. And this really returns to what the colleagues were discussing this morning on the project Pasture Fed for Life. And there is a potential to feed the world if we were not using concentrate feed while keeping the positive impact on the environment, on people, and on food security. Of course, this means a different distribution of the food proteins from plant or from animals. Um, if you look carefully at uh, the share of livestock product, you see that it's 51%. So really for organic agriculture to be, uh, or even combined with no uh, concentrate feed to be feasible, we do have to, to change our consumption. Um, requirements, our diets. We have to go toward more sustainable diets. And one it would be one minute. Yeah, it would be one third less of meat would be needed to be able to uh, to meet the needs. So when we look at sustainable intensification, yes, we do have uh, more, uh, we, we can cultivate without more land with sustainable intensification, the same with, with organic agriculture. We can have more output in sustainable intensification from the same area. In organic, we need more land. Um, we have no adverse environmental impact in sustainable intensification. We have only enhanced environmental impact in organic. The buds are very important, and this is another element that we should bring into the picture is that the yields in sustainable intensification very often don't find a market, uh, and, and I'm going to come back on this, and a lot of money is going into sustainable intensification research. If you look at the website of Feed the Future of USA, USDA, uh, and USA, they actually together, you would see that one third of the funding for ag research is going to climate resistant cereals. So the input that is going into sustainable intensification in terms of research and support is huge. <coughs> And this is not happening in organic agriculture. And this is another thing I would like to fi finish with, is uh, a comparison 
between the Bill Gates Foundation project of the Millennium Villages in, in, in Africa and organic agriculture in Africa at the same period, about 10 years each. The AGRA program has started in 2005. The EPOPA program started in 97 and finished in 2000, uh, 2008. And you see that the investment of the EPOPA project, which is the organic project, is about 1.7 um, million dollars per year. And you see that it's about 25 for AGRA. Uh, the, ner the number of household touch is also quite impressive. We have 90,000 uh, 90, in the case of AGRA and 200,000 only in Uganda for EPOPA. And most importantly, when you look at the uh, income that's coming back from the investment, you see that in the organic project, the investment has been less than two, pers le less than two dollars per person per year, and they have generated 20 million US dollar of export of organic products. And the, uh, the African farmers who have been under the Agra project, who have tripled their maize production, did not find a market for their production. And when we look at the research, we realized that in order to triple this maize, the scorn um, yields in Africa, it was enough to, to have early plowing and wheat control. We had exactly the same result by the University of South Africa. While in the Agra project, they had to pour a lot of hybrid seeds, uh, a lot of training, storage, and a lot of fertilizers. And each village of these 80 villages has about four master degrees and one PhD to support them. So the input in terms of support is huge and it's not nearly, you know, it's not at all compared to, to be compared with the organic outcome that we have from the same different paradigm but the same objective of increasing yields for food security. <coughs> so what we can say that the productivist approach is definitely good in terms of raising food availability on average. In some places it will, in others not. So we will need trade. It's not good enough to improve the access to the hungry to food. It's not enough to um, improve the nutrition, the malnutrition. Uh, and it's not good also for the stability of the, uh, of the system in terms of macroeconomic crisis. So if we look at the four component of food security, only one barely is met by sustainable intensification. In the case of organic agriculture, the problem we have had under the modeling is that we would need 334 million hectares more of land if we had to go organic versus 70 million of non-organic to sustain the, sa the same demand in 2050. So we definitely need to have a shift of diets and we need to consume less meat or dairy product of one third to one fourth on a global basis. Uh, and in terms of environmental benefits, of course, I've gone through that, they're all positive. So the outcome of the modeling, which are not out yet, <coughs> I will post the um, preliminary report in the coming weeks. And it's a preliminary report. Now we're going to have to have a phase two to look at uh, better characterization of pasture data, at biofuel, at farm income data, and so forth, and finish it in June. And after that, we will do a scientific paper in a major journal. So it's it will become recognized on a worldwide basis. And you will see it on the um, sustainability website, which I have developed for the Rio Plus 20 conference. And under the organic website, we will post the um, case studies of organic agriculture innovations in Africa, including the Agra EPOPA comparison, but also many other case studies of interesting holistic management, for example, of livestock in pastoral areas in Africa, where you could see that you can have higher intensity of animals per hectare and higher productivity. And it's all question about pasture management and rotation between paddocks and so forth. So it's quite interesting in terms <coughs> of evidence that's coming out on this. And with this, I'll finish. Thank you. Thank you.